Let's talk about interlesional collagenase. Yeah, let's talk about this this um, interesting enzyme. So collagenase is a it's a flesh eating bacteria, and it comes from a clostridium uh, biomolecule, so it's a bacteria, and and its job in the bacterial setting is to just destroy collagen so that the infection can spread right through any part of your tissue, any part of your body that has collagen. What has a lot of collagen? Your skin. That's what makes it nice and bouncy. And as we get older, not so bouncy when we lose collagen. So collagenase is amazing. It just rips through. But not all collagenase is the same. There's, I mean, if anybody has spent any time in a basic science lab, you can just pull it off your shelf and make it up for you know, any one of your experiments to 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 render uh, protein. So you're looking for the, the DNA you're looking for. You throw some collagenase in, get rid of the protein, there's your DNA. So collagenase is multiple different ACEs and anything that ends in ACE is just an enzyme. And so the thought behind this was actually goes back to a good friend of mine, a uh, dear, dear friend of mine, Marty Gelbard, when he was a resident at UCLA in the 1980s, who his resident project for the year, for the research year at UCLA, was thinking about this collagenase in Peronis. He was very interested in it, which at the time very few urologists were, but for some reason took a shine to thinking about this condition that was really an orphan condition. And he knew the plastic surgeon uh, surgery guys were using collagenase for scar reformation and seeing if it can soften cutaneous scars. And he said, well, geez, that's what Peronis is. It's a scar. It's in the penis, but it's still a scar. And that sort of led to the groundwork for a lot of research that then eventually led to knowing exactly what types of collagen are most in a peroni scar is type one and three. So the so the the idea was that can we make a collagenase that's specific for type one and three so that if we inject it in a penis, it doesn't just destroy the skin and everything else around it. You want a very targeted enzyme. So if you put the thing in your in your science lab into your skin uh, to uh, you know for the cheap cheap collagenase, you're going to end up with a lot of collateral damage. So so this is really an engineered molecule. It's a targeted molecule made up of the two most predominant uh, proteins in a collagen plaque. And essentially the idea is you put collagenase onto type 1 and type 3 collagen, it disappears. It's gone. You can take it in a petri dish. It's amazing. It'll it'll be gone in 45 minutes. doesn't work that well in humans for a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons we're still studying. But at this point, after 30 years or so of, of research and data and drug development, that's when collagenase for, for intralesional therapy in the penis was approved in 2013. In 20, 2008, it was approved to dissolve the, the collagen-based plaque in the hand for the Dupuytrens. And that that's sort of the quick history of collagen uh, therapy or collagenase therapy. And it, uh, it really has changed really has changed the entire face of men's health. When I trained, I trained as, mostly as an infertility microsurgery specialist who did some Pironis, did some erectile dysfunction, but mostly, you know, my future is going to be in infertility. And thankfully, it still is. And I still do a lot of infertility work. But over the years, I've built, developed a very robust peronis practice in no small part just because of the research I did that led to the development and FDA approval of this drug. It it has truly changed lives of, of many, many men. Mm-hmm. And it's great. I mean, it's, it's some men will have, you know, complete resolution of their scar and curvature. But it is also... As I said a few years ago, I was interviewed in New York Times and probably uh, made everybody at, at Endo who makes the drug cringe. I uh, said it's not a super drug. I mean, it's still you know not 100% effective. Mm-hmm. It's better than anything we have. That was 10 years ago. There's nothing even in the pipeline. So this is still the only game in town, and we're getting much better at injecting it. We're getting much better understanding protocols to even further improve our outcomes. And and so again, still a huge game changer. Still an amazing therapy that that doesn't have a huge downside. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's it's still minimally invasive. It's non-operative, and um, and can go back to work the same day. So so yeah, it's a, it has a pretty fantastic safety track record for for improving curvature. But if a guy comes in with a ninety degree curvature and thinks he's going to be perfectly straight with collagenase, I tend to disavow him of that and try to set realistic expectations. But the majority of men that go through, at least in in my practice, we have about 80% of men that get one round of eight injections are happy. They're satisfied. Doesn't mean, and again, this goes back to patient bother, not necessarily angulation and curvature. I want to know if you're happy with your treatment and if you're happy 
healthy with your penis. And if your partner's happy, to me, that's a win. And that's a pretty effective medication. So how do you set the expectations? Eight treatments over how long? How much modeling are they going to have to do? And what is the average expectation? First of all, it has to be you want to make sure you're going to a place that has a very good team in in place because this is a a big ticket item drug. It's not Mm -hmm. cheap. And so authorization is incredibly important. Most insurance companies carry it, but you want to go to a, an office that deals with this a lot so that you get authorizations, you don't get surprise billing. There's also patient assistance for it. So, so men, if they have an out of pocket expense, there's a number of patient assistant portals that men can go to to get some of the offset. And so that's the first thing I do is expect the set the financial expectations. Then I say that what's going to happen is you're going to get two injections in a week. Most of my men come in on Monday and a Thursday. And then you're done with me and the 405 and the traffic to get to my office uh, in six weeks. And then you come back and you get two more injections. And so it ends up being a course from the minute I start that injection to the last eighth injection. It's about a four and a half month course. It's not all active. I mean, they're in my office for really minutes of that time. We have a pretty good system to make sure we're we're not making people wait too long to do it. And in between, I have them start modeling right away. Now, again, I, I have to say some of what I say is is not on label. It's really experience. I don't inject the way that the label says to inject. I and I tell all my patients, I'm going to treat you exactly how the the drug was developed. But I have some nuances and modifications that I found have worked better with pretty good clinical data uh, at how we do it. And so one of the things is I have them model pretty much immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we set the injection and even that day or the next day, I have them stretch for at least 90 seconds a day. And then I have them come back in the next uh, two to three days. We do it again. And then, yeah, I want them to go to town. One of the other things that is, is critical to bring up and, and, and again, off label considered, the hurdle for a lot of men is on the label, they say, well, doc, I read this and it says I can't have sex for four weeks after this. And that's a kind of a deal breaker. And that's a long time mm-hmm. to say, okay, you're going to give me an injection. And then I wait four weeks. So I have basically two weeks of sex before I come back and get whacked again mm-hmm. and then get out of commission for four weeks. And that it was based on some pretty weak data uh, that came after label. So phase four studies showing that that there was one reported penile fracture with intercourse at about three weeks. And mm-hmm. so out of an abundance of caution, which I'm delighted that Endo did, uh, they said, look, we want to be sure. So we really want people to refrain for four weeks. Now, you're going to get erections during that time period. You're going to wake up with erections and you have almost as much risk of fracturing your penis just from an erection at night and you roll over in bed funny than you are with very well lubricated man uh, with penis in control of intercourse. And so I tend to be a little bit less mm, dogmatic about that. And I know most of my my uh, Peroni's colleagues that do a lot of injections have also gone a little bit away from that because that is sort of uh, disruptive and, and there's really no good data that you're doing anything differently. And in fact, with some of the aggressive modeling protocols that are making the rounds now, you're essentially doing way more trauma to the penis and maybe getting a better outcome. So in some ways we might be doing too gentle, you know, and, and yeah. sex might be a good part of kind of physical rehab. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah in a, in a responsible, you know, way. <laughs> yes. Well lubricated in control. <laughs> there you go. I like it. <laughs> and then what degree of curvature reduction can someone expect? This is where I hate statistics and quoting because if it if you get a full reduction then I'm the best doctor ever and this is the best drug ever and if you get zero then this drug sucks and you just wasted my money and time mills so what the heck yeah and so I we looked I I, I tortured a medical student a couple years ago <laughs> uh, he was amazing sadly he went into ophthalmology maybe it was my fault but it was a uh, he's a great guy and uh, he's gonna do well I'm talking about you, Reza, but he, uh, I made him do this giant multivariate analysis and look at all of the things that go into our database for how somebody's going to respond, presence of diabetes, length of plaque, degree of curvature, all of this stuff to see who's going to be the guy, who's going to be that super responder. I want to come in with a nomogram. I want to be able right. to examine a penis. I want to be able to say, you're this, and, and here are the characteristics, your curvature is this way, this is what your ultrasound showed, you're going to be 50% better. You're gonna, mm-hmm. I'm going to take your 50-degree curve, make you 25, 
everything's it's going to be great. Or if I see a guy comes in, has really dense plaque, and say, mm, you know, you're probably going to be closer to 25. Really, we just don't know who's going to be a great responder. And I've been surprised. I've mm. been so surprised over the years. Let me tell you a story of a guy. He was very inside uh, healthcare. He was a healthcare administrator. And he came to me. He wanted to be in the phase three study. He knew, he knew about He's read about it. He was on all the trades. And he said, I want to be, I want to be in your study, Mills, enroll me. He had a calcified plaque. So I did, I did an ultrasound. I, I, when I do lectures on this, I'm sure one of them is online somewhere. Uh, and I, I show his ultrasound and, and his, his uh, x-ray, plain film x-ray. You can see bone in his penis. That's how bad the plaque was. But he had some collagen around it as well. He, it was a heterogeneous plaque. So he had some calcium and collagen. And I said, I, you're excluded. I can't. I'm so sorry. I can't do this. But, but calcified plaques are excluded from the trial. So December 13th, 2013, that's the day that Zyflex was approved by the FDA. January 3rd, he was in my office saying, it's time. I'm ready. We're doing this. Yeah. Didn't want surgery. He had a 75 degree curvature. He got down to 40 degrees with Zyaflex with a calcified plaque. That's he was good. a guy that you would say, no way. But he did pretty well. So I still inject men that have calcified plaques. I just don't inject the calcification part of it. So mm. that part of that is really targeting it, getting understand either with your tactile feedback or even with ultrasound to know where to avoid. You can inject a calcified plaque. It's bone. You're going to break a needle, God forbid, inside that plaque. So you have to be really careful and and inject the part that's going to win for you. And and so even those men have a good recovery. I've had other guys had the tiniest plaque. I've had guys that have that the plaque is totally gone and they're still curved. So again, that just goes to show that we just don't know. So if somebody is amenable to the time it takes, that's the big deal. So I say, look, this you may or may not respond to this. You've been dealing with this for one year, two years, five years. And if you want to be better for a cruise in three months, we're going to go to the operating room and we're mm -hmm. just going to fix this for you. And here are the risks and benefits of that. So that's sort of the expectation I set. But the number of men that I've operated on after Zyaflex is pretty small, surprisingly small. When I mm. see 1,200 at least guys a year with Peyronie's disease, and I'm still operating, I do one or two, well, probably three or four Peyronie's disease surgeries a month, uh, but I do many, many more Zyaflex injections than that. So I still think the majority of guys do better. It just depends on how you define better. Do you think those people are not getting surgery because they're better or because they just never wanted surgery? There's two things I would tell you that to, to poke a hole in my statistical analysis. One is, is right, or did they just get frustrated? Mm -hmm. And and were they never surgical candidates in the first place? That, that Not too many. I mean, I you know it's a minimally invasive surgery. Even a, I mean, I can do a plication under a local. So I don't think it's that. And most of the guys that I'm doing Zyaflex on have pretty good erectile function. I'm not, I'm not doing it on guys that, that, you know, aren't getting good erections. So we don't think that's it. There are guys that, you know, may just get frustrated or live so far away from me that it's not worth coming back. But no, I think most of them are probably getting better. We, we tried to look at that and do some long-term follow-up and maybe we'll have some publications soon to, to show you what that, that denominator looks like. But, uh, but no, I think most of them are, are okay with how they're doing and, uh, and relatively sad. Satisfied. But again, the ones that aren't and and do surgery, it doesn't seem to make the, the surgery any more difficult. And sometimes I think I've I've seen men that would have been a plaque excision and graft, maybe 75 degrees, that I can get away with with a plication. And so there there are certain cases where it may help prime or stage them. But mm -hmm. boy, it's a it's a time commitment. I mean, I can't underestimate that until that these these men are, you know, four and a half months to get 10 degree improvement and then still do surgery. That's why, you know, a lot of times we just go right to surgery. Yeah, it is a time commitment. Is there an improvement after the first injection and after, like after each injection or do you have to stick it out for the four months? Yeah, there is a, again, it's a scatter plot. There was, there was a, an early, early study by, by Faisal Yafi and, and Wayne Hellstrom, I think when he was still his fellow, that showed that if, if you didn't get much improvement after three rounds or six injections, you weren't going to see much on the fourth. That caused a lot of people to drop off, interestingly enough. Uh, but I haven't seen that. And then and actually, I think in the in the phase four studies, a year after therapy, people were still getting some improvements. And I've, I've seen that in, in, you know, in about 20% of men that we do a round of Zyflex on and they're not better and we bring them back. I used to just kind of march right along, get, get the authorization and say, come back in six, eight weeks and let's just keep doing these for these big plaques. But partially, again, this is an accident of how busy I am that, that they can't necessarily come back in in that time. 
And there are men that report that they are actually getting better. They're not as bad. In fact, I not too long ago, it was maybe a week or so ago, had a guy, <laughs> great, he could have called. He lived in the Central Coast, right? So three, four-hour drive, and, and he was there for a second round, sat in my office. The needle was there. He was ready to inject. He said, yeah, I'm better. I'm, I'm good. I just want to make sure we don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> You could have called. You just get eight hours, you know. So, yeah. so yeah. I mean, I think my new protocol is is to give it give it some breathing room in that enzyme and just the stretching. There's still some plasticity that can last well after that last injection. 